All righty. Well, you know, I guess the class size has been reduced a little bit. <laughs> All right. So what we'll do is we'll continue the discussion from last week. Uh, last week we talked about call and return already, the instructions. CAL call and the return is RET just by itself. Uh, we talked about those already. We talked about the make file. Did we talk about the make file in this class? I think I did. Just, you, mentioned, yeah. you, mentioned, you mentioned it. Mm, I did not just mention it. I fixed it up and I actually posted it, included that into the homework assignment. That, that was during lab. That was during lab, which was recorded mm -hmm. and posted onto YouTube. So I'm not going to repeat all that stuff here. Oh, you're recording right now? I am recording right now. I think. Yep, I am recording right now. <laughs> okay, so for those of you who missed lab last Thursday, you know, it's on YouTube and you can you'll definitely watch it again and again <laughs> until you think, okay, I think I got it. So your eyes bleed. So your eyes bleed. Yeah, it depends on what kind of fluid it's bleeding, you know, so. <laughs> Watch it till it's the your dreams. sequence of what haunts your dreams. So, um, so what we'll do today is we'll talk about the call frame, we'll talk about um, convention, okay? So in other words, um, how do we write subroutines in assembly that can interact with subroutines that are written in C? So that would be kind of useful, okay? Um, so that's all the things that we'll talk about. We'll talk about the local variables and the return value, which is what you need to do, uh, understand for the homework assignment. So, so these are all the things that we're gonna do. Um, so let's go ahead and start with a particular you know, interesting program, and we'll go from there. Okay, so all the topics, all the material are in the links already. I'm hoping some of you are starting to read the linked you know, material. So assuming that you have read you know, a little bit ahead of me, I'm just going to do the explanation using sample programs today. All right, so we'll start with a particular program. Um, well, maybe not something you know, too <coughs> crazy at this point. So we'll go to the temp folder and create a program called, um, we'll just call it test1.c. And all it's going to do is to pass some parameters to a subroutine. But that subroutine is going to be an, a, a subroutine written in assembly. So we want to understand you know, how parameters are actually passed to a subroutine from the perspective of the call lead, not the caller. Okay? So that's what we'll do today, you know, at least in the initial part. Um, so this is going to be a void function. And we'll just say it takes you know, one, two, and three. Um, parameters and this is all we're going to do we'll just go ahead and call f with kind of unique values for the parameters so we'll have the 23 as 1 41 as 1 and then we'll have um, the 64 as the last one, okay and that's all we're going to do okay that's the entire you know c program which doesn't do anything that's useful okay um, but what we'll do is we'll actually write the subroutine f in assembly and we'll put the breakpoint at f in assembly and then we'll check out okay but where are the parameters okay that's what we'll do <coughs> save this and then we'll write the subroutine f and the convention that I use now you know when we are dealing with both uh, C and also assembly you know, code is we'll use f dot s you know f is the name of the subroutine itself and it has to be using uppercase s because otherwise GCC does not automatically recognize what kind of source file it is in order to compile it. Okay? So GCC can be used to compile C programs, but as well as assemble assembly language programs. Um, there are other implications when we use uppercase S, uh, which is it, it does pass through the C preprocessor. We can use pound define and all the other pound features in C and C++ when we use uppercase S, which is kind of handy sometimes, okay? So at some point, we're gonna have pound include even in assembly language programming, but not at this point, okay? So at this point, we'll just go fairly simple, okay? And we'll say dark global F. What this does is, ex is exports um, the symbol F, 
so that the linker knows the definition of f, which is defined in this particular program. Otherwise, the linker would not be able to resolve the unresolved reference to f. And amazingly, this is the entire subroutine. This is pretty much as short of a subroutine as you can write in assembly. Okay, it only consists of one single instruction, which is the return instruction. Well, okay, I lied. This is as short as you can get. <coughs> you need yeah. the extra space. Hmm? You need the extra space. Line two. I believe you can skip the extra space. You know that would that would even work. Yep. So everything should be in the one folder. Say again? So everything should be in one folder? Or? No, no, as long as they can be found, they don't have to be in the same folder. Um, you know, so, but at this point, I'm just going to put everything into the, sub, into the same folder. As long as the linker can find the object files, it has no problem. You can put them into different folders and it will still be OK. All right. So what we'll do is we'll do a, we'll do a GCC um, you know, dash G, because we want to <coughs> include debug information. And in this case, we'll do a dash wall just to double check the program to make sure that there's nothing suspicious about it. Yep, go ahead. So if you have two subroutines with the same name in the different folders? Um, you can have the same subroutine in two different source files in two different folders, <laughs> or even in the same folder. It doesn't really matter. But if you try to link those object files, then the linker will complain because the linker tries to make sure that you can only have one symbol, one unique symbol definition for every single symbol. So, so it won't work, you know, whether you, they're in the same folder or not. So this is just compiling the C code into an object file. When you do an ls, you can find that uh, test 1.0 is over here. This is the object file, which is the output of the process of compiling. And we're going to do the same thing with the assembly code. Okay. And the assembly code is f.s. And you can see that, hey, the C compiler does not have any problem assembling an assembly source file. And in this case, it knows what to do because of the extension. Okay. Dot uppercase s tells the C compiler, hey, this is not you know, a C source code. This is in assembly language. And it will do the right thing and create the object file. <clears throat> and then the last step is to do the linking, which is a dot dash o. So a dash o basically just you know, give you, well, give us a an executable called test one in this case, and I have to give it all the object files that it needs in order to um, create the executable, like that. And if I do an ls right now, I would have the executable, the object file, another object file here, and then f dot s s and also test.c, test1.c are the source files. Um, I did not make a make file out of this, you know, just because, you know, it's only two files is not a big deal, okay? <clears throat> All right, so what we'll do now is to go into GDB um, and figure out, hey, where are the parameters? Uh, we'll put a breakpoint at uh, function f, and this is one really cool thing you can do with uh, GDB is you can set up a breakpoint at the entry point of a subroutine just by saying B and then the name of the label. It doesn't have to be a subroutine. It can be any label. If you do a B and then the label name, it will just put a breakpoint at the instruction of the label. Are, they, are we doing okay so far with uh, everything in GDB at this point? Okay. So let's go ahead and just run the program and it will stop in the subroutine as expected. Okay, um, if I just do a C or continue, the program will just kind of finish because you know, this subroutine doesn't do anything. It doesn't crash, it just does not do a single thing. Okay? But what we want to do is to figure out, hey, where are the parameters? So the first thing we can do is to say, maybe the registers are containing the parameters. Well, if that was your answer, you're kind of halfway right or partially right because when you look at the, uh, well, maybe not. When you look at the registers, we do not have any one of those in the registers. I think you have to turn on a switch or pragma in order to do that. So the registers do not contain the um, parameters. Why do you think it's not such a great idea to use registers to store parameters? Not big enough. Sorry? Not big enough. It may not be big enough, right? Because you know, for simple subroutines, yeah, I mean, one or two integers is not a problem. 
But what if you're passing an entire structure by value? Well, the registers won't be enough. Okay. So where do you think is a space where both the caller and the callee have access to, and it, do, it does not need any special names? The stack, all right. <clears throat> so they, they should be on the stack somewhere. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll take a look at the stack pointer, which we are already looking at. So the stack pointer is now pointing to this location. And can someone remind me, by definition, what is the stack pointer pointing at? The last byte of the last Yep, the last thing that we put on the stack, okay? The very, very last thing that we put on the stack. So we'll go take a look at what that thing is, okay? What do you think is the stack pointer is pointing to at this point? Mm, well, let's take a look, okay? So we'll do an examine and we'll inspect one thing at a time, okay? So one WX, the W once again means 32 bit, X means he in hexadecimal. And we'll also you know, use ESP with a dollar. Um, so this refers to the value of the register ESP. And it does not look like any one of the parameters, but it does look strangely familiar. What does it look like to you? Memory address. Looks like a memory address, but which part of memory are we talking about? We only really have like a few major portions, dot text, dot data, or the stack. And this looks like a, um, say again? Dot text. Dot text, okay, you're right. It looks like dot text. Because, because when you look at exactly because when you look at EIP, which is the instruction pointer, or basically our PC, the program counter, it is like that value. It's not exactly the same, but it is within that neighborhood. Okay, so what do you think we are looking at on the stack right now? Why do we want to put an address of dot text, which is where the instructions are located, on the stack? This is coming. Through. A place to return to, a, a location to return to. This is in fact our return address, which is the very last thing that we do when we call a subroutine. Okay, okay. But I'm not giving up yet. Okay, I'm not seeing any of the parameters, but I'm not giving up. So I'm going to display two items <coughs> from where the stack pointer points to. So instead of printing one, I print two. Hey, one seven in hexadecimal is sixteen plus seven, which is a which is 23. Did I use 23 as a parameter? I did. Okay, that's one of them. So maybe the other ones are here too. Does anyone remember what is 23? Which is, uh, is it the first or the second or the third parameter? First. First. It was the first, okay? So that means, you know, I'm gonna jump here to four, and you can see we have two nine, which is, um, uh, 32 plus 9, which is 41, okay, which is our second parameter. And then we have 4, 0, which is 64, which is our third parameter. They are all on the stack in this order. Yep. So why, why we are using like a 1, 2, and 4? Um, because I, you know, because I was trying to, you know, make you guys think about it. So I display the first one first and say, hey, that's not a parameter, but, but what is it? And then I display two, which includes the return um, address and also the, the first parameter. But since we find the first parameter, the other two are probably right next to it, and that's why I jumped to four, so that you know we can show all of the relevant portions. Yep. But does that say like a, as an integer every time, like a four bytes at a time? Well, that's only because in C, I declare those parameters as ints. And this is a 32-bit architecture, so an int is 32-bit wide. Okay, those are all very good questions. So are we doing okay so far with this particular subroutine? <clears throat> so the next question is, now that we know the parameters are pushed on the stack in reverse order, okay, because the last parameter has to be pushed first so that it has the highest address. The first parameter is pushed last, so it has the lowest address right uh, about the return address, okay? But how do we get to these? In, in, in other words, in the subroutine itself, if we are going to make use of these things, what are we gonna 
do in order to access them. I cannot just pop them, right? Because you know, the return address is in the way. But that's one really convenient solution. It's called the base addressing mode. Okay, now before we kind of talked about the base addressing mode as a shortcut for one of the homework assignments, but now the base addressing mode actually comes in very handy. Okay, so that would be the first thing we talk about, and then we'll talk about the, the concept of a return value. So let's go ahead and talk about the base addressing mode. Okay, so what I'm do, doing here is I'm going to uh, change the way I write this program. I go back to test, and this time I say, hey, make that return an integer, okay? Maybe I just want to add A, B, and C together to become the actual return value. So that gives me a reason to access the individual parameters, okay? And as such, what we'll do here is we'll double check by having a local variable x, and then we say, okay, let's store the value of f into x. And you know what? I think I'm going to um, reassemble, relink, you know, the program as it is now, because I want to see what is what kind of value x is going to get, just the way it is. Are we doing okay so far with this? So I'm not doing a single thing with f. I'm keeping f, you know, as a basically useless subroutine. I don't even specify a return value using any way. Okay, it's just a single return instruction. But it is still going to compile, it's still going to link, it is still going to give x a particular value. So the question is, what is it using to you know, store into x? What is being used as a return value? And I think some of you might have read, or oh, this one here, you know, no, no, C calling convention. Did anyone read this portion? Read this link, okay, some people did, okay. Um, you might recall from that linked document, uh, it already actually talks about you know, what is used to specify a return value. If it is simple like an integer or a chart or anything, something like that, okay? So we'll talk about it today as well, but I want to keep it kind of half hidden at this point because I want you guys to find out with me you know, how we pass a return value, okay? So we'll go ahead and uh, just getting lazy here, so I'm just going to <coughs> rerun uh, 503, and it's okay, it's just complaining variable x is uh, initialized but not used, it's no big deal, you know, it's just a warning, 505, you know, which is not necessary because I did not change the assembly code at all, and then just you know, relink everything, okay, so now I have a new executable that can do everything. That really kind of just kind of prompt me, maybe I should do a make file on this one so I don't have to redo this all the time, just say make uh, test1.gdb, you know, that would bring me into, bring it into the debugger right away. Okay, so we'll go ahead and debug test1, just like before, and we'll put a breakpoint in um, F, the subroutine, the entry point, run the program, and now we are in subroutine F. Okay, same thing as last time. We take a look at uh, what is on the stack. Four things, each one is a 32-bit thing printed out in hexadecimal. If you don't want to print in hexadecimal, you can always specify just regular decimal because that way you know, we can actually see the values. Um, so you can definitely tell you know, 23, 41, and 64. The first number is a return address specified as a base 10 number and that's why it looks kind of awkward Okay, because we, we are used to looking at addresses in hexadecimal and not in decimal. Okay, so at this point, mm, do you see anything on line three that might specify the return ad the return value? Not the return address, but the return value. I do not see anything, okay? But if you have read the document, the, that either my document, which has to do with uh, local variables and return value, or the other document you know, that is linked from my site, but, it's, but I didn't write it, C calling convention, then you might you know, remember that E8x as a register is used to specify a return value. So I have a suspicion that E8x is being used as a return value. But how can I verify that? How can I say, okay, how, you know, how do we design this experiment just to confirm that E8x 
is in fact used as a return value. What about we just display the value of EAX at this point? Okay, so we'll say print dollar EAX. Um, well, that is not a very good value because you know one can be coincidental, right? It is possible that local variable X not being initialized might start with a value of one also, okay? Because it's a fairly common value. Okay, so what can I do in GDB so that um, this is more unique. We can change it, right? We can use set var to change it. So we're going to say, you know, set var. I'm not sure whether this will work or not, but I think it does. So we can change the value of a register by, you know, setting it to, I don't know, give it something that's, you know, more unique. So we'll do it like um, F E D C and then uh, 4321. Okay, that seems pretty unique. And double check just to make sure that the register itself is changed and not just the special variable is changed. We'll do IREAX, and it is in fact changed. Okay, so now we have changed the register, the value of register EAX before the return instruction. It's time to do a single step to go back to the C code. Single step, go back to the C code, and we are done with the assignment statement on the previous line, which is on line six. In other words, Line six has already taken the quote unquote return value of the subroutine and stored that into X. Now would be a good time to check because if everything worked out the way I suspected, X should also have the value of FEDC4321 in hexadecimal. So let's check that, okay? Um, and it does. So, you know, um, so for those of you who did not read uh, ahead of me, uh, this is how you return a value from a subroutine. So that should deal with one of the subroutines that you have to write for your homework assignment. Johnny is done. And I'm not going to tell you which instruction you should use to return a value of five, okay, because you know, I think you should be able to make the connections at this point. The second question of the homework assignment is what? What, what does the other subroutine do? One more, okay? So one more is a little bit more complicated. You have to uh, specify a return value, but the return value is not a constant. You cannot use an immediate operand to specify the, the value that you're returning. You have to access the parameter, okay? Well, in this case, because we only have one single parameter, it's actually pretty easy to deal with, okay? You can use a variety of ways to do it. Um, one way is to pop everything off the stack, use the one that you need to use, and then push the return address back onto the stack right before the return instruction. I mean, you can do that. It's not the best way to do it, but it can be done. But that approach, in general, does not work very well because uh, you can only pop so many things off the stack into registers because you only have so many registers. It is best not to pop things off the stack if you don't have to, okay? So that brings us to a new way of doing things. I'm changing the order of doing things here <coughs> uh, compared to the notes. Uh, in the notes, you know, I talk about using the base <coughs> addressing mode using the stack pointer. I'm gonna skip that, okay? So I'm, good f I'm gonna give you the actual proper way of accessing parameters by using what we call the frame pointer. Okay, all right. So we are going to use our f.s as a you know, guinea pig here. And what I'll do is I'm going to introduce a few offsets. So the way this works is like this, okay? I'm, I'm going to use comment on in the program itself as documentation, okay? So when you watch the YouTube thing, you know, you can actually see what you see in the text file and that's actually, you know, the, the picture of the stack, okay? So F in this case, I'm just going to you know, re-specify the prototype of F. It has a return type of integer as A, B, and C as parameters. That's the prototype of F. And obviously this is not gonna work, you know, because it's not a, this is not a C source file, so I have to comment out this code, otherwise the assembler would try to interpret you know, int, F, and so on and so forth, and it's gonna choke. All right. 
So in this case, you know, as we have already discussed, C is pushed on the stack first. Okay, so it occupies the highest address of the three. Okay. So we'll have you know C over here. Well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't use a colon, but C is here. It's going to use up one, two, three, four bytes. Parameter B is next to it. It also uses up four bytes. And then parameter A is next to that. It also uses up four bytes. And then we have the return address, which also uses up 32 bits or four bytes. I'm just going to make everything align so it looks visually appealing. There we go. So everything is now aligned. This is what we have on the stack when we get to the label F. Okay, when, when you first get to a subroutine, this is what the stack looks like. We want to access A, B, and C, add those three, three numbers together, and return the sum in EAX. Okay. Well, that's actually pretty easy to do. Okay, I don't even need a frame pointer to do it. Okay, so I'm gonna. Uh, I'm, I'm still debating whether I should go through the process of using a stack pointer first and then go to a frame pointer, but I'm suspecting that some people will try to use as much shortcut as possible and just forget about using the frame pointer and just use a, use a stack pointer. <coughs> so I'm gonna. So I'm gonna talk about that later. So I'll talk about the proper way to do it first, and then talk about the not so proper way to do it, and I'll explain why it is not a best, the best way to do it. Okay. So what we'll do is I will give you the code first, and then we'll go ahead and explain, I'll explain what the code is actually going to do. So we'll start with a push EBP, which is the frame corner. EBP is called the frame corner and do a pop EBP at the end, okay? And you can see the way I write the code is not sequential. If I start with a push EBP right at the entry point of a subroutine, I'm going to do a pop EBP right at the end of the entire subroutine because that's the proper order, okay? Um, just doing this all by itself, okay, the push EBP and the pop EBP, do you think it's gonna hurt anything? <coughs> Now, to the caller, would anything be changed or messed up or corrupted? No, no, it's just completely useless, right? We, because we are pushing a register on the stack, quote unquote, saving it on the stack, right? And then we do absolutely nothing, and then we pop it back out from the stack, which is restoring the value, which is unnecessary to begin with, but it's not gonna hurt anything, okay? So we're gonna do something here that will change it. So what we'll do is we're going to say move L ESP to EBP, and then we'll have a matching instruction here to do this. Okay. Well, <laughs> this time we are changing EBP because whatever it was before the move L instruction on line 12 is going to be overwritten, but it's going to be overwritten by the stack point. Okay. Um, and then the act at the exit point of this subroutine on line 14, I'm doing exactly the reverse, okay? I'm copying the stack, the frame pointer to overwrite the stack pointer, uh, and then I do a pop L right away, okay? So you can see these instructions are the first two instructions and the last, well, not the last two, but uh, the move L and the pop L instruction at the end of the subroutine, they are matching, okay? Just in opposite directions, okay? All right, so, at this point, I'm going to <coughs> uh, actually do something about it. I'm going to use a move L instruction, and I'm going to move C or A, you know, pick one, okay? I'll move A into um, EAX first, okay? So the question now is how do I copy the four bytes known as parameter A into EAX at this point? There are quite a few ways to do it, okay? But first of all, let's update the picture of the stack because it is not just having four items now. Now we have another item, which is what I usually call old EBP or the saved EBP. That is pushed the first thing into the subroutine, so it is going to be right below the return address and take up these four bytes. Is that okay so far? Okay. And because I copy the stack pointer to EBP, right after the push L EBP instruction, 
That means at this point, I have two pointers pointing to this location. This position is pointed to by EVP as a register. It's also pointed to by ESP at the same time. Is that making any sense? Because after all, I just copy ESP and EVP. Neither is changed until afterwards. So they are both pointing to the old EVP, which is the one that I saved on the stack. Are we doing OK so far with this code? There are no new instructions at this point. Okay. So what, what I'll do next is going to be the, a new addressing mode to some of you. But if you have used the base addressing mode already, it is nothing new. All right. So what I want to do is to copy um, parameter A on the stack into register EAX. Okay. So I know the destination is going to be EAX here. No big deal. Okay. And the question now is, what am I going to specify here as a single operand in order to copy parameter A into EAX? Well, we can kind of see that it's close to where EPP and ESP points to. So maybe we can start with an indirect operand, okay? Because the indirect operand is close to what we want to do, but not quite. And because we have a frame pointer, we're going to use the frame pointer. What do you think is actually going to be copied? What is going to be copied into EAX as it is now? ODBP, which is not one of the parameters, okay? How far is parameter A from ODBP? Eight, eight, eight bytes away, okay? So if you remember what is a base addressing mode, or if you have used it before, we can do something like that, okay? So put, putting a number or an expression before the parentheses is basically just saying, oh, add this number, um, Take it back, because if I set it one way, it implies that we are changing the register. So I will rephrase it. Yep, go ahead. So it should be negative 8 or 8? It should be 8, because it's on the, in, on the positive side. <sighs> Up is higher address, and down is lower address. OK. Um, so getting back to this particular operand, it's, like a, it's a memory operand. It is almost exactly like indirect with one twist, okay? With an indirect operand, we are only using the indirect register to tell us where to grab something as the operand. This gives us a, a flexibility. It says, hey, not exactly there, but eight bytes away from where EVP points to. It allows me to specify a constant offset from where a register points to, okay? Are there any questions about the based addressing mode? It's almost like indirect, except you can specify a displacement or an offset. So it's not right at that point. You can also see the indirect operand as a special case of the based addressing mode. This is indirect. OK? So indirect is basically a based operand but with a displacement of zero. Basically saying, right there, wherever EVP points to, that's where the where I want to copy. But since I don't really want to copy ODBP, I now have to specify an eight here. To specify eight bytes away from where EVP points to is the first byte that I want to copy. But because it's a move long instruction, I ends up I would end up copying four bytes and not just one. I'll be Doing okay so far with the base addressing mode. Okay. All right. It's a really nice shorthand. You know, this is one of the CISC addressing modes that I really, really like because it makes things so much easier. Okay. So I just want to add up all the parameters. Hey, the next one is at a displacement of 12. <clears throat> and the last one is a displacement of 16. I'm done. Is that making any sense? Yes. Okay. You can count the number of you know, XX, you know, to actually you know, figure out the displacements, but I think you know everybody is has a pretty good idea that they're off by four. You know, each one is four bytes away from the other one. 
So if the first one, if the first parameter is eight bytes away from where EBP points to, the next one is going to be 12 bytes away, and then the last one is going to be 16 bytes away. Shall we give it a test? Okay, let's go ahead and <clears throat> give it a try. And we'll, okay, fine, I'm gonna use a make file. I'm giving in to using a make file. This is also a good exercise. Yep, go ahead. What's the point of using Well, the point of using an EBP, and I think your implied question is, instead of ESP, yeah. right? The point is, um, I was about to, I will explain that later, but since you asked the question, I will answer the question now. Um, ESP changes whenever you push and pop. ESP will go lower, and then when you pop, it goes back higher again. So as you need to put more things on the stack because you need to save a register, or you have other things to do, um, ESP is, is constantly changing. Okay, so the displacement from ESP to a particular parameter will change as well. So if you use, use ESP instead of EBP, you would have to mentally keep track of your program and say, at this point I have just pushed two more things on the stack, so the displacement from ESP to the parameter will be off by two bytes. So you have to mentally keep track of all that stuff, which is not easy. EBP, on the other hand, does not change during the uh, execution of this subroutine, so that's why you know the displacement can stay "quote unquote" constant the entire time. Yep, go ahead. So my question is that then you copied EBP back into ESP. Correct. Well, let's say that ESP did change and you copied EBP. That, that means you can be sloppy. <laughs> that means you can be sloppy. Like um, you can push something and forget to pop it. But because we are copying EBP back to ESP, we are basically popping everything all at once. Um, so that's kind of like a shorthand thing, you know. Um, that's the way um, your code is really structured. When you have a regular C++ or C subroutine compiled, this is actually the code of the entry, co ent entry code and the exit code of a C function. Yep. Because when you use a pop, you are, you are assuming the stack pointer is balanced and at the right place. But the move is saying, hey, we know where it's, where it's supposed to be. We'll just put it back to where it's supposed to be. But you do have to understand the meaning of all of this code here, because in the final exam, I will give you code that does not use the standard in entry and exit code, and you will have to figure out, you know, you know, if it is erroneous, what kind of problem is it gonna get into? Okay. So we're gonna change this program, and this is also a good illustration of this make file, you know, basically how flexible the make file is. I have one uh, .c file, I have one assembly file here, which is uh, f.uppercase s. That's all I need to do to change this program. Well, I'm gonna change the name of the executable too to test one, get out of uh, the make file, and just say make. It's auto magical. <clears throat> so now we can go ahead and, oh, in fact, we can do this. Did you guys see what I said? I said make test1.gdb, which is a virtual target. It's, the, I mean, it's not going to create a file called test1.gdb, but the rules will trigger the execution of GDB with, a, with an up to date test1 executable in the process. So this is a quick and easy way to make sure that when you are debugging your program, you are in fact using the updated version of the executable. Because the worst thing that can happen when you're debugging programs like this is you make changes to the source file, and then you either forget the reassemble or the relink, and you'll be debugging old code, okay? The executable will contain old code, but when it displays it in GDB, it will appear to be new code, and that's the most frustrating things you can en encounter when you're debugging programs in this class. It's worse than getting a segmentation fault. Trust me on this one, okay? If you don't trust me on this one, fine. Don't use a make file. <laughs> don't make. Do it by hand. <laughs> All right. 
So we'll do uh, the same thing, okay? BF, okay? You break breakpoint at function f, run the program. Now we're in function f. Uh, we can single step through this instruction because at this point e a x should have the value of the first parameter. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure out whether that's the case or not. It's good. At this point, it should have added up the first and the second parameter, and let's check that. That looks good to me because I think the second parameter is 41, so 23 plus 41 is in fact 64. The last parameter is 64 itself, so when we add 64 to 64, we should have uh, 128, and here we have, we have 128. <coughs> as a bonus, okay, as a bonus of playing by the rules, using the frame pointer the way it's supposed to, we can now use backtrack even when we are writing code in assembly. Okay, did I explain what is backtrack in this class? Because I keep getting mixed up between CISP 360 and this class because you know, the other class uses just a regular C uh, compiler. Okay, backtrack is BT, okay, the command is BT in GDB. It's one of the, yeah, well, it's one of the very, very useful um, commands in GDB when you're debugging a program. I'll tell you, I'll show you exactly what it does. This is BT, uh, it doesn't show the parameters. No. Okay, never mind. <laughs> but it, it still displays certain things that is useful. Okay, it's showing us that we are currently, um, in terms of source code, we are on line 18 of f of s. Well, that's great, okay, we already know that. But it also shows us how we got here. This is telling us that a function call in main, which is in test1.c on line six, is what triggered the execution of the subroutine that we are in at this point. Now, if you are like six levels in from main, it will display all six levels. Now, that can be a very useful feature for debugging a program because now, not only do you know that you are in function F, but you also know who called you. If you have like 30 calls to a single subroutine, okay, and you're stopping in the subroutine itself, you don't know which one is responsible for where you are at this point. BT can tell you, okay, backtrack. All right, so now we are all done. We will single step through the uh, move L EBP to ESP, and then we'll single step through the pop L EBP, and then we'll single step through the return instruction back to the main program. X in main is now 128. I just got the uh, summation part done, which is also basically saying I got your homework done. <laughs> because your homework is actually easier than function f by a long shot. Yep. Uh, you said eax holds the return value. Right? Yes. But what if the return value is longer than four values? That's a good question. I do not know. I would suspect the most significant 32-bit will be stored in EDX and the least significant 32-bit will be stored in EAX. That's kind of like an Intel convention, you know, to combine EDX and EAX into a 64-bit number. So I'm suspecting, you know, the compiler would actually do that. Okay. We can check it. I mean, if you want to, we can go ahead and uh, just mess around with it. Um, yep, go ahead. Another question. Uh, is two overloaded operators, is there an easy way to do it, like using assembly code? No, that's not an easy thing. Um, when you're talking, this is regular C and not C++. The main difference between C and C++ is in regular C, if you have a function called F, internal to the linker, it is just F, okay? In C++, because you can do overloading, in other words, you can have the same function name f, but if it takes on different parameters, you, it will take on a quote-unquote in, you know, different internal name. It's called name mangling in terms of a compiler technology. So the actual name is not f anymore. It is actually you know, some gibberish you know, that the compiler piles on on top of f that implies what type of parameter it is taking on and also the return type. 
So that's why, you know, if you don't know how the name mangling part works, you know, what is the algorithm for name mangling, it is almost impossible to mix and match C++ code and assembly code. It can be done, you just have to understand how name mangling does, does it. That's a good question. Yep. And that programming did if um, the function f mm -hmm. also calls a, another function or another subroutine, what happens to that sort of that diagram thing of the, of the memory. The okay, well that's a good question. So the question is, what if subroutine F is calling another subroutine, right? Okay, that's a good question. Let's do it. So we'll go ahead and go back and change our test1.c file. And this time I'm going to write function G in C. Okay, so function G is going to be written in C and it will take um, two parameters, okay, int a, int b, and this one's going to return the product of these two numbers, okay? Are there any questions about g as a c function? Okay, I was hoping that nobody would ask any questions, and sure enough, nobody asked any questions. Very good. Okay, so g is really simple. It just you know, returns the product of two numbers. So now we want to call g in f, okay? So let's figure out what we're going to do here. And, well, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it in F here. Save, F, okay. So I'm going to change the meaning of this program here, and I'll use comments to indicate what this program is supposed to do. So I want this program to return A times um, function G called with uh, B as parameter A of G and C as parameter B of G, okay? This is what I want to do in regular C. I want to do it now in assembly. Is that okay so far? Okay. All right. Hmm. Well, we just have to play by exactly the same rules here. How do we pass parameters to a subroutine? Well, I, can, I, I should not use the multiplication. I'm going to use an addition here. The reason is, you know, I have not talked about the multiply instruction yet, so I'm going to do an add here. Okay. So the, the question now is, uh, how do we pass parameters to a subroutine? We just talked about it about 15 minutes ago. How do we pass parameters? Push them on the stack. Push them on the stack. In what order? Reverse. In the reverse order. So in this case, which one should be passed or pushed on the stack first? C. C. OK, very good. Um, you know what, I'm really getting sick and tired of having to keep track of all of these offsets by hand. So I'm not gonna do one thing to help myself, you know, to um, remember the offset much more easily. So what I'll do is I'm gonna do something here. And the first thing I do is to define the value of label EBP to be just zero, okay? EB, old EBP equals to zero does not change a register. It does not generate any actual code to run you know, during runtime, all it does is to tell the assembler, hey, whenever you see this label ODBP, it's really the same thing as seeing the value zero. There's no difference between zero and the symbolic name ODBP. Is that okay so far? Yep, go ahead. Is that kind of like a variable though? No, it, it is a label. It's still a label. The colon, the colon thing is actually, okay, when you look at F colon, it's actually the same thing as F equals dot. And the dot is basically the counter of the current second, which is dot text in this case. So that, so what that means is F colon is really just a shorthand of the definition of a label using a equals in It's just easier to type. Okay, so if ODBP is zero, which basically means the frame pointer, EBP, points to its old value. That's basically what it is. The next one is the return address. Then I'll say return address is ODBP plus four. What I, what, I'm re what I am really doing here is to keep track of the offset of various items on the stack that I might need to refer to, okay? <clears throat> and can someone tell me what is right after the return address? Parameter A, okay, so A is return address plus four, B is right after that, C is right after that. So the way I do it like this, instead of just you know saying, 
oh, A is 8, B is 12, and C is 16, is make it all relative. So this way, if I need to make adjustments, like you know, making having a new parameter in between two, I don't need to change everything. Okay, I can let the assembler do the calculation so I don't have to deal with it. Is that okay so far? Okay. All right. So with these offset labels defined, now it is so much easier to deal with it. Um, I can do it in <coughs> risk instructions or I can do it in sys instructions. So we'll go ahead and just do it in uh, risk in instructions first. So I'm going to move C EBP into EAX, push EAX on the stack. Because the last parameter is pushed first, so it has a higher address. Is that okay? Then I'm going to push the other one, so move B EBP to EAX, push EAX on the stack again, but this time it's actually pushing parameter B on the stack. So at this point, we will have parameters B and C on the stack. Hey, it's time to call the subroutine. Just call G to let it do its thing. So call G. When G returns, what about the return value? What about the product of B and C? Where do you think it should be? EAX. In EAX, exactly. So we are playing by exactly the same rules as the rules that apply to C subroutines. Okay, which is great because now we can actually communicate with a C subroutine. Okay, but before we move on, um, I'm going to clean up the stack. What is on the stack at this point, which is basically what your question was when we call another subroutine, right? Okay, so at this point, what is on the stack? In addition to the return address, the OEBP, and the three parameters, we also now have uh, another copy of C on the stack and another copy of B on the stack. Uh, those two are for calling G, right? The return address is gone, because by the time it is already returned here, so the return address is already consumed. Well, the return address from my perspective, okay? So because I have to, from, from calling G. These are the two things remaining on the stack. So the stack pointer will now be pointing here. Um, if the stack pointer is pointing here, isn't the frame pointer going to point here too? No. Did I do anything with the frame pointer after I move ESP into EBP? Absolutely nothing, right? So the frame pointer points to a fixed point on the stack so that I can use all of the offsets that I pre-calculated to access all the parameters without having to worry about additional pushes and pops on the stack. Is that making any sense? Because that's really kind of explaining multiple things at the same time, but it makes sense because they are all connected. There's a reason why it is done this way. Do I still need a B and C on the stack? No. The function call is over, right? So let's clean up the stack. What is the best way to clean up the stack here? Hmm? Okay, go ahead. Okay, that's one way to clean up, but that cleans up the entire stack, right? If I just want to clean up, quote unquote, locally, which means you know only these two items do not need to are not needed anymore, what is one way to clean up just these two items? Set to a zero. Set to zero. Mm. I do, I want them gone. I don't want them on the stack anymore. You you were mentioning something. Yep. You just move ESP. Right? Yep. We can just change ESP, but how do we change ESP? to reclaim the space of the two parameters. Just pop it twice. Well, you can pop it twice. Now, popping is one way to do it, but popping is expensive, okay? Because popping is always going to read back those bytes from the stack, which is in memory, into a register, okay? So ideally speaking, it, that, that's not necessary because I don't really need those values anymore. I just need to change the stack pointer so it is not having those four bytes eight bytes anymore. What about uh, moving up a base address and moving them outside of the beats? Mm, you got the right idea, but it's not a move instruction. Go ahead. Uh, copy uh, EBP back into ESP? Mm, that's what someone else you know, suggested, oh. yeah, but that's going to clean up the entire stack. I may not be ready to clean up the entire stack yet. Okay. Yep, that's it.
That's it. Because all we need to do is to move the bookmark and say, hey, you know what? Those eight pages before the before this bookmark, I don't need those anymore. Yep. So I'm talking about subtract uh, ESP from EVP. No, you don't want to change EVP. EVP should stay constant for the entire execution of this subroutine. This is it. This is it. This is going to clean up the stack. So the two parameters that was intended for G is no longer quote unquote on the stack. Okay. Are there any questions about the add long dollar eight instruction? Why it is there? Now, technically speaking, we don't need it because the last instruction or the second last instruction, which is a move L EVP to ESP, will clean up the stack anyway. Okay. But as good programming practice, you should clean up the stack as soon as you don't have any need of that space anymore. So that's why you know I always do something like this after a function call, clean up the stack because all the parameters are not needed anymore. Okay, so let's move on to what this uh, subroutine is supposed to do. So now I have computed you know um, G B C. Okay, uh, what is left is just adding one to A. One of the registers already has part of the answer. I just have to do something else to it. Okay. E a X. E A X already has the result of B of calling G with B and C as parameters. Right? So I just need to add parameter A to whatever E A X has at this point, and I'm all done. Add long A E V P E V P to E A X. That finishes up the entire subroutine. Are there any questions about this particular program before we test run it? Yep, go ahead. I think that the, what we are using A as a before uh, EBX. Hmm? Are you talking about this A here on yes. line 29? Yes. That is actually referring to this A over here. As a variable? It is defined. It's not a, it's not a variable. It is a label. <laughs> It is a label which is basically saying A is defined to be return address plus four. But what is return address? Return address is ODPP plus four. But what is ODPP? It is eight. So effectively, A is really just eight. Okay? But I don't want to refer to eight as a constant because what if I add some more parameters before A? All of those things will change. So I would much rather do it this way and leave it up to the assembler to do the calculation. I don't want to deal, all, deal with the calculation. All I need to know is the, the width or the number of bytes per parameter. That's all I need to know. Okay. Are there any other questions about this? No. Okay. So this is interesting. I did not really plan out you know, this class you know, this way you know, before I walked in. So this is kind of interesting because now we have a subroutine written in assembly. It is called from C. And in return, it calls a C function. Okay, but because I think we are playing by the rules, it's going to work out just fine. There's no reason why this should not work out. Okay. So let's go ahead and give it a test one, and then after that, I will talk about why would you want to write a subroutine that is in entirely written in in assembly, and yet you want it to be callable from regular C and you know, C plus plus functions. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, do a make. Nice. You know, I'm so glad that I made that make file. There are certain things in life, you know, that is just little things that you enjoy and say, ah. And a properly done make file is one of those things. <laughs> All right. So in fact, I can say make test one dot gdb and bring us into gdb right away, which I like too. Um, Okay, here's the other question. Why do we have to bother with test1.gdb? You know, make and then gdb test1, it's just as quick, you know, why bother with make you know, test1.gdb? Because I don't want to make the mistake of forgetting the make before gdb. Okay, okay, let's, let's say I made changes to one of the source files, okay? F.s in this case. 
Okay? So I fix one thing and I exit out of the editor and then I forgetting that I need to make first, I say, oh, GDB test one. Well, what I'll be using would be the old executable, which is already in the folder, right? So, but when once I'm in GDB and I say, hey, show me line number blah, blah, blah of, you know, f.s, it will show the updated source file. So once again, that's gonna lead to massive confusion, okay? Because I would say, hey, but this instruction is doing something weird. It's not doing what it's supposed to. Well, that's because the, the program, I did not remake the program. So by using, you know, this is what we call a virtual target, or one way to refer to it is a virtual target, test1.gdb, I make sure that I have the most updated executable before I get into GDB. So there is a reason, this is not really just a shorthand, it makes sure that you are debugging using the most up-to-date executable that's based on your source code. Okay, I'm leaving as little room for human errors as possible, and yet I'm writing programs in assembly. Yep. It will compile as necessary. So we don't need the wrong make person and the wrong make person. That is correct. That's the whole point. All right. So we'll put a breakpoint in F. We'll put a breakpoint in G. Okay. And we're gonna have some fun here. So we'll go ahead and run this program. Uh, we are now in F. So if you do a BT just like before, it shows us that we are here because main called us. Single step, single step, single step, single step, and now we're in G, okay? So I'm just gonna continue because we have a breakpoint in G anyway. So now that we're in G, it switches back to C code because G was written in C and not in assembly, okay? So the first thing we want to check is, um, did we pass the parameters correctly? I don't have to do a single thing because GDB automatically displays, when you're in a subroutine, it automatically displays um, the parameters of the subroutine. So right now it says parameter A of G is 41 and parameter B of G is 64. That's correct, right? That's cool. What about BT? I'm kind of curious about BT. What is it going to show us? It shows us that we have three frames at this point. Okay, frame zero refers to the current frame where we are at at this point. It is in G, and the parameters are 41 and 64. The frame number one is one frame before this particular function call, and it has, um, you know, it doesn't show the parameters because it's written in assembly. And then we have you know, frame number two, which is two frames ago, okay? This is like, it's the first frame that got created because it's made the entry point of the entire program. Does everybody understand how to read the output of G, uh, BT? What is that? C, comma, uh, y, comma, 5, or this, C5? What's that? Mm -hmm. What is that? 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 What is File name and line number of the file. Yep. Alrighty. And you guys can do fun stuff with this program too. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit out of the scope of assembly language programming, but some of you may find this useful in your other programming classes. You can actually say frame two and put yourself back into the context of the main subroutine. Why would I do something like that? You can actually do all kinds of stuff now that is local to main, such as local variable x is now accessible. Okay. I can say print x. Well, it has some kind of your odd value. Fine. You can even change it. I'm changing local variable x of main to two, even though the current execution point is in G. Okay. And if I want to continue debugging the program, I can set the frame back to frame zero. So I can say frame zero, 
now I'm back into the uh, fun back in function G. This is something that might be useful in your other types of uh, programming classes because you know, it gives you the ability to go back and change one of the local variables of a function that is several calls before where you are at this point. Okay. Does anyone think, uh, does anyone think you know, this might be useful in the general debugging of a C, C++ program? VT is particularly useful when you are dealing with C++. Yep. Uh, can I change the next in frame too? Mm -hmm. Let's say if x was a parameter to the next frame, would that change that also? Or is, since it's already been called, would it, would it change? Um, if x is a local name to the next frame, you know, whatever frame you send it to, it will look at things from that frame's perspective. I'm not sure whether I answered like the question. If yep, go ahead. There's a function called name. If x was one of the parameters, would it also change the parameter? Or since you already called that? It won't change the parameters. Um, what this might be useful is you have a local variable that is either passed by reference or a pointer of that is passed to a subroutine. So you can go all the way back and change the original variable, local variable to something, and all the you know, changes to propagate. <coughs> um, PT is also particularly useful when you're debugging C++ programs, in, you know, not C. The reason why I said that is because in C++, there are things that are quote unquote hidden. The constructor, the destructor, okay? The hierarchy of constructors, okay? Because some constructors refer to a constructor of, of a superclass and so on and so forth. So by the time you get into a subroutine, sometimes you might want to know, how did I get here? Well, you got here because it is called by the constructor of a superclass, which is called by the constructor of a subclass, and so on and so forth, okay? So you can basically look, you can look into the entire chain of calls to get into a particular subroutine. And on top of that, it gives you the ability to inspect anything along the way, okay? Any local variable, any parameter along the way, you can inspect those things. Uh, in C++ programming, I think it is particularly helpful because a lot of times, you know, even I cannot keep track of, you know, what your know, constructors are implicitly called, you know, when, and this gives you the entire picture of, you know, how those uh, constructors and destructors are related. So I, I think it's going to be a useful feature outside of this class. Yep. Uh, since when you're putting stuff on the stack, it counts down. How much space do you have? for the stack? The stack has, um, well, we test ran a program that keeps pop pushing and not popping yeah. anything. Um, so it started off with B, F, 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 something. And it went all the way down to B, 8, and then all the zeros after that. So we are looking at, in hexadecimal, would be 8 followed by 6 zeros. And that turned out to be, I think, um, how, how much was it? Okay. Um, eight megabytes? Right. Yeah, approximately eight megabytes. Yep. Is there any way around that? Um, well, I have not encountered a situation to change that. Yeah. But if you want to find out, it wouldn't be too hard. Linux change process stack. Uh, you see it as, okay, normally you won't need to use all that, but in case you do. Yeah, you can, um, you can do a set R limit and then change it by a set, get R limit and it's a set R limit. So apparently that will do it. Okay. Well, that's you know, one, one of the uh, documents. How do I change my default limits for stack size? <clears throat> you can also change it to U limit dash S size um, or go to etc slash security slash limits dot com set a particular variable. If you look at the feedback. 
back. Yep. So the command line to do it is u limit dash s size. I, I think u limit is user limit, so it applies to all processes that belongs to the end user. And to double check and confirm that, we can now you know just run a man page on u limit. Okay. It's obsolete. There are probably multiple ones. Yeah. LMFB, a quick question. Oh, okay. Sometimes I get obsessed with quick questions. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any questions about this program? We are not quite done tracing it yet, you know, but I think the rest is actually going to be pretty simple. So, okay, so we are right at the return instruction or the return statement of subroutine G. So we'll single step and single step one more time back into assembly code. So at this point, EAX should have the return value from G already. So we'll just go ahead and calculate what is 41 times 64. It is supposed to be 2620. And then we'll say, okay, is that value in EAX? Excellent. Okay. Now, if you don't if you don't trust your own typing, especially when you're dealing with like values like that, you can actually ask this question: What is EAX equals to uh, 41 times 64? And it's true. <laughs> yep. Go ahead. Yeah. The subroutine is only responsible to clear up things that it put onto the stack, and also the return uh, the return point the, the return address. The caller is responsible to remove the parameters. Okay. Yeah. So at this point, we still have you know those extra parameters on the stack, and you can visualize this pretty quickly by displaying six items on the stack, uh, starting with what the stack pointer points to. And you can see that we have two copies of 2.9 because the one is a copy that I used to pass to G and the other one is a parameter passed to me as function F. Okay? So those two are not needed anymore. So when we change, when we add 8 to the stack pointer, we clear those things away from the stack. And then we just add A to EAX and that would be my own return value. Single step, single step. In fact, you know, the, the rest of the program is pretty boring because when you print X, it is 24, 2647, which I think is the correct answer, okay? Because it should be uh, 23 plus 41 times 64, and that's exactly the right number. Can I try ESP now? ESP? ESP? Well, we're in main right now, so ESP is not going to be particularly useful. All right. Are there any questions about the programs that we worked on today? The code that we worked on today? Does anyone know how to borrow my code for your homework assignment? <laughs> how long would it take to do your homework assignment? Assuming you guys got everything else set up, like the make file, the folder, and stuff like that. Two minutes? Ten minutes. Okay, that sounds that sounds completely reasonable. Okay, but the main point is you have to understand what those instructions are actually doing. Okay, that is the important part. Okay, so we are almost there. What about recursion? Well, let's do recursion. I mean, uh, why not? I mean, there's no reason why we cannot do recursion, right? So we look at test one dot c and we'll do it in regular C first, okay? Then we'll change it to assembly, just to see, hey, can we do recursion in assembly? So we have a subroutine age, and I'm gonna make this boring, so it's not the, it's not even factorial, because I don't want to bother with uh, multiplication, okay? So this one is going, only going to return, um, you know, one plus two plus three plus four, all the way up to parameter i. Yep, okay. So, and I'll use a single return statement here instead of a, uh, conditional statement because I can say if i is less than or equal to zero, just go ahead and return a zero. Otherwise, return i plus h, uh, h calling h on i minus one. 
think that should be it. Yep, there we go. Okay. So it is a recursive definition. Um, do you think it is any more special than G or F? Or me? It's not special at all. Okay? Because the way we call a subroutine is going to be exactly the same way. Okay? We pass the parameter on the stack, we expect the return value in EAX, and everything else should work exactly the same way. Okay? All right. So let's go ahead and test the C code first just to make sure the logic is correct. Okay? So we'll say x gets you know, uh, h of, uh, I don't know, 5. Okay? Does anyone know the closed formula uh, of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5? Well, I know at least one person is taking CISP 440, and we just talked about it this morning. The summation of i going from 1 to some n, okay, assuming n is an integer, that has a closed form of n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Okay, that's the closed form. So that means, you know, if n is 5, you know, I should see 5 times 6, which is 30, divided by 2, which is 15. Okay. So we'll go ahead and test this first, just to make sure that, you know, it is correct. Um, in fact, we'll say make test.gdb, um, put a breakpoint on line 17, run the program, print x, it is 15. Okay, so, so we got the logic right. All right, so we'll, what we'll do next is we'll go ahead and display both files at the same time. So test one and this time h dot uppercase s. So we'll display it side by side. So as I implement h, you can actually see the C code corresponding to the assembly code. So dot global h, just to export the label h, um, and all the usual stuff. Okay, push ebp, pop ebp, and this is just the way I do things. You know, it's kind of like matching parentheses. I know some of you prefer to type things in a sequential order, but I don't really do that. And since there's only one parameter, well, you know, I'll just go ahead and do it too. O E B P is zero. Uh, return address is O E B P plus four, and then we have a single parameter i, which is return address plus four. Question? Okay. All right. So now we can actually do some work here. So the first thing we want to do is to compare i to zero. Okay. You know that you can be done with one single instruction. Okay. I E B P we want to compare that to zero, okay? I reverse the order of the two operands because um, when we perform a compare, it is subtracting the first operand from the second operand, okay? So this way I can preserve the actual meaning of the code. Um, if it is not less than or equal to, which means if it is greater than, we want to go to the else case. So that means it'll J, G, because it is signed to a label else, and I'll define the label else over here. So when I get here, it means it's less than or equal to. That also means the return value is just a flat zero. But I also have to remember to jump to the end of the conditional structure. So jump to end if and define end if over here. Okay, so now back to the else part here, which means you know, i is greater than or equal to one. Um, let's go ahead and do it. So we'll do a call to H. But when I call H, I have to push not I on the stack, but I minus one on the stack. So I can do the pre-calculation on the register and then push the register on the stack. There are a few ways to do this, okay? So I'm just gonna do it the typical way, which is, you know, copying I to a register subtract one from the register because I'm not supposed to change the parameter itself and then push EAX on the stack because EAX is now I minus one. Call the subroutine, which is myself, and once it's done, add four to the stack corner to balance the stack because those four bytes are not needed anymore. And the return value is now in EAX. So the only remaining thing I have to do is to add parameter I 
my parameter i to eax, which is the return value from the subroutine, and that's it. We're all done. Are there any questions about the, the code of function a? Questions? Okay, let's go ahead and test it. Okay. And to test it, we have to change the make file a little bit because I need to link it with h.s. I also have to go to test.c and get rid of um, function g, uh, function h definition. So pound if zero, pound and if. It's basically the same thing as commenting out something, you know, um, except this way works also when you have comments in between. Using the macro feature to comment out a chunk of code is more effective than using a slash star and star slash because this can nest, whereas using the comment way to do it is not nestable, cannot be nested. Well, anyway, you guys can look at this later on. So we'll go ahead and do a make. Wow, make test1.gdb. Put a breakpoint on line uh, 20 because we just want to, I just want to make sure the program is still functioning correctly. So run the program, print x. Ooh, it is not working. Okay. All right. That gives me something to do. Well, because uh, you push I onto the EAX, shouldn't it be EBX? Because when it else just run into it, oh, wait, not in there. Okay, let me double check on this one. Okay, compare I to zero. If I is greater than zero, go to else. Otherwise, we put a zero into EAX and call it done. Otherwise, we move I into EAX. And if we subtract one from EAX, we push EAX on the stack, we call H. When H returns, we clean up the stack, and then we add my own I to EAX. And then we exit. Oh, I forgot one important instruction. It's actually so typical of, typical of me as well. I forgot one of the most important instructions in a subroutine. Even the simplest subroutine should have it. A return instruction, exactly. I'm even surprised the program did not crash. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay, test1.gdb. Okay, do the same thing, break 20. Execute, yay. Okay, this time it works. <laughs> Okay, so getting back to why are we going to write subroutines in assembly, and yet we need to make it so that it can be called from C programs, okay? So the way I'm gonna show you this is to go to my really, really old website, drtech.org. It's really old. I mean, I have not maintained stuff here for a long time. Um, this is what I did one summer decided, hey, I'm kind of bored, I'm going to do this. Um, so what I did was I wrote a small real-time kernel. Okay, it's not an operating system, it's just a real-time kernel. So it has multi-threading ability, has time slicing and all the usual stuff for real-time systems. Uh, this would be something that is suitable to put into like an Arduino build platform so that you can actually have true multi-threading capability um, so they can run multiple threads at the same time. It has time slicing and all the other features that you need in order to run parallel threads with a small architecture. But I wrote the entire real-time kernel in assembly. Well, because I need to push registers, pop registers, and stuff like that, there's no way I can do it in regular C. Okay? But since I wrote the entire you know, real-time kernel in assembly, that might imply that people who want to use the real-time kernel would also have to write their code in assembly. But that is not a really good assumption, okay? Because who's going to write an entire program in assembly? And by the way, this entire real-time kernel, can anyone guess the footprint or how many, um, how much memory it is going to consume, just code-wise? Minimal. 
Hmm? Minimal. Well, what is minimal? <laughs> <laughs> what What is minimal to you may not be the minimal to Microsoft. Like two percent of its available storage. Well, that's really really pushing it. You know, it depends on what kind of device you're using. It is actually about two percent of certain uh, members of the AVR family. The real time kernel is has a footprint of two kilobytes. As in 2,000 bytes. Because I know you guys don't use that unit anymore. What is a kilobyte? Oh, I think my father knows about it, but you know he rarely talks about it anymore. Well, 2,000 bytes, okay? That's the footprint of a, a real-time kernel. So when you look through this documentation, you know, it has, it has some assembly code and whatnot. But when you look at the actual uh, interface, you know, how to make use of the real-time kernel, it's all in C. In other words, you know, I show, uh, this would be a good one. So this is an actual program that you can write, you know, that makes use of the real-time kernel. It doesn't do anything particularly useful, but it is written in C. So the real-time kernel itself has an, has an API or an application program interface that is in C and, C and also C++ compatible. So if you write a program in C and you say, hey, I need this to be in a multi-threading environment with scheduling and all the other stuff, you can actually make use of my real-time kernel because it can interface with regular C programs. Uh, there's a certain percentage of code in Linux that is also written in assembly. Okay? And that, once again, you'll need to be interfaced to the C code portion of the Linux kernel. And that's why it is important to understand how C code passes parameters so that you can write code in assembly, so that you can implement certain things in assembly, and yet most things can be implemented in C. Are there any questions about uh, all this stuff? Nobody seems to be particularly interested in all this stuff. <laughs> it was actually a lot of fun for me. I, I debugged this whole thing, you know, without using GDB because the platform it's running on is just an MCU or microcontroller unit which does not run any operating system. So how can you debug a program when you have no debugger running on it? I got my debugging tools. I got two LEDs. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, if the green LED lights up, I know I got to at least this point of the program. <laughs> if the red LED blinks, <laughs> that means I at least got to that portion of the program. That's how I debug this real-time kernel. Yep. How many cycles are you losing multi-threading? Um, not a whole lot. Um, I actually use it in one of my consulting projects. And the overhead of the multi-threading uh, kernel is less than you know, two or three percent. It depends on the time slicing because the, the more frequently you time slice, the more the overhead. So I was time slicing at I think one millisecond per slice, and it, it was fine. Um, in my previous job, you know, at UC Davis, this kernel was also used in uh, robots, you know, to navigate through a maze. It's called a micro mouse project. Um, and it was actually successfully used in those projects without any you know, real issues with overhead. And those are 8-bit processors. Okay? This real-time kernel is designed for 8-bit processors running at 16 megahertz. Once again, you know, units that you do not really hear of these days anymore. What is a megahertz? I think my grandfather talked about that once. <laughs> okay, so, you know. But just to show you guys you know, why you might be interested in understanding you know, how to call uh, functions from C to assembly, and vice versa too. You, know, you can actually do it in the reverse order. All right, we are running out of time of the lecture, so I'm gonna stop the lecture here. Today's lab is going to be your homework assignment, so it will be unstructured. You know, if you have questions, I can answer those questions. Um, that's about it, I think. Homework is due one week from today because now you have everything that you need. I should make the due date like five minutes from now, but you know. I need a computer. I need a computer right now. It takes me five minutes to log in. Do have to the lab. To the lab. That sounds like a line of Nelson.
Simpsons. Yeah. To the library. That's right. <laughs> to the library. Yeah, man. Uh -huh. To the lab. All right. Coming out of West Batman? Yeah, the original. That was a game arcade in Davis. And the name of the game arcade was the library. <laughs> 